On unleavened bread, he was buried. He rose on first fruits, not the day before, not the day after. Shavuot or Pentecost happened on Pentecost. So do you understand the fall events will happen on those days? That's just it. We don't know what year. We're not date setters at all. But it's important to realize the events will happen. And the other thing is this. They're going to happen in order. You can't have Pentecost until he rose on first fruits. He's not going to rise until he's buried. He's not going to be buried until he dies. Well, it's the same thing. There's three fall feasts that we're going to go over, and they will happen in order. And the first feast to be fulfilled prophetically. I mean, people, they don't understand prophecy unless they understand this. This is fundamental. And uh, the first feast prophetically to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, which is tonight. It started at sunset last night, and it goes for two days. And we're going to talk about that, what that means. How about the word moed, an appointment? The divine appointments. How many of us believe in divine appointments? Well, it's nice to know God's already scheduled some of them. You know, God's already told us he's going to be there, so we want to be there. So this is an overview of all seven festivals. So the, there's basically a couple of calendars. Just like in the natural, we have a fiscal calendar and we have our regular calendar. In Judaism, they have their religious calendar and they have their civil calendar. And this is basically the religious calendar starts the first month is Nisan. But on the agricultural calendar, the first month is the month of Tishri, which is today. It started at sunset last night. It's the first day of the month of Tishri. So you see in the first month, you have Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And then 50 days later, you have the Feast of Pentecost. And then in the seventh month, the month of Tishri, you're going to see the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So these feasts deal with the first advent of Christ. These feasts deal with the second advent of Christ. So again, if you'll notice, Passover is separate from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days long. So it's kind of like bookends. You have Passover followed by the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then in the seventh month, you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last feast, which is seven days long, followed by a separate feast called Shemini Atzeret. And we're going to be talking about that in a couple of weeks. And basically what Shemini Atzeret speaks of, it's the eighth day, which symbolizes eternity. Happy birthday. Today is Shana Tov, or Happy New Year. In our calendar, January 1st is our new year, right? On the Hebrew calendar, today really is a happy birthday to the world. In Judaism, this is the day the world was created on this very day. As a matter of fact, the first word in uh, the Torah is breshit. We read in the beginning. But breshit in Hebrew, you can turn it around and it says the first of Tishri, which is what today is, which is quite interesting. And so today is uh, Happy New Year. So you can say Shana Tov. Say that, Shana Tov. There you go. Very good. That's Happy New Year. Now, everyone here is familiar with Hurricane Katrina, right? Uh, don't you always have a desire to know in advance the likely occurrence of some important event that's going to impact your life? When, I mean, they at least had, what, a few days, a few weeks, maybe a week's warning. Some of them took advantage of it. Some of them didn't. Uh, especially if it's a life or death issue. Wouldn't you want to know in advance when something was going to happen? Well, see, the Lord gave us these festivals, and so we could understand the divine appointments and know uh, what to expect. And so, again, let's review for just a second for those that weren't here last week. Go to the next clip. This is from Leviticus 23, and it's verse 1 and 2. And it says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and saying to them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Now, the word feast really is moed, and it means what? An appointment. And the term convocations means dress rehearsal. But if you'll notice, we are to be proclaiming them. And that's what he's doing. He's like the town choir. He's proclaiming them. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm proclaiming them because I want you to understand how important they are. So let's take a look at the next clip. Uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles are the three fall feasts. And here's what they represent. The Feast of Trumpets represents repentance. Feast of Yom Kippur is redemption. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is rejoicing. Can you see how that makes sense prophetically? You've got to repent before you can be redeemed. And after you're redeemed, then you rejoice. They occur in that order, prophetically. 
And so what's very important for you to realize is the idioms for the Feast of Yom Teruah. Now, Yom Teruah, if you remember, means the day of blowing. Okay, the day of blowing the trumpet. Now, how many of you have different names in one sense? You can be husband, you can be brother, you can be son, you know, friend. Well, this feast has different names. And the reason why is there are very important meanings that each one has. So on your notes, I've listed the different uh, events that will happen on this day. Just like Passover, they rehearsed killing the lamb because what happened? The lamb died on that day. So these are the different events that we're going to look at from a scriptural standpoint to see what's supposed to happen on this day. How, what is it symbolic of? It is known as the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the tribulation. I believe we'll begin on this day some year. Also, it's known as the day of the awakening blast, which in Hebrew is the not Saul, or in English it would be the rapture. I firmly believe, and I will show you today how it will happen on this day, but again, I have no idea what year. And as far as if I'm pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, I'm pan-trib. Have you heard of that? Everything will pan out just fine if you're serving God. And uh, I, I do believe it will happen on this day, whether it's the same year the tribulation starts, I have no idea. That's not, my point is not to set the date of the rapture, but I will tell you it will happen on this day. Uh, also, it's called Yom Hadin, which in Hebrew means the day of judgment. Uh, it also means the opening of the books and the opening of the gates, and you're going to see all this plain as day in Scripture. It's also known as Yom HaKaseh, which means the hidden day. It's also known as HaKidushin, or Nesuin, which means the wedding of the Messiah. The wedding will take place on this day. And lastly, it's known as Hamelech, which is the coronation of the Messiah. How many of you want to be there when he's crowned at the ceremony, when he's crowned? I mean, there's this one song, I want to be there, when the trumpet calls. I tell you what, I want to be there. It will happen on this day. Uh, I just came from a Yom Teruah service in Gig Harbor. Four or five Messianic congregations were together. We blow the shofar a hundred times and everything, and it's awesome. And we sing songs relating to these events. Uh, some of them is, Awake, O Israel. You know, we need to awake. Uh, another one would have to be uh, to doing with him being the king over all the earth. Uh, and it's quite exciting. And so let's take a look at this next clip here. That's the moon with stars around it. And on the verse in Genesis 1.14, uh, on your notes, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them, you notice it says them, that means the sun, the moon, the stars, not any one particular one of them, but let them collectively be for number one, signs. Do you know what the word for signs means? The Hebrew word is in Strong's 226, it's oath, and it means a signal, like a flag. If you remember that the, the Magi, they looked at the stars and they understood that the Messiah had been born. And so we see firstly that they are to be used as signals, that the heavens, that God uses them to signal us what's happening. Also, it says, and for seasons. The word seasons here does not mean winter, spring, summer, and fall, as you may have thought. In the Hebrew, the word is moed, the same word as festival. They were for the divine appointments. They were so we could plan and know when the divine appointments were. Very important to understand that doesn't mean winter, spring, summer, fall. And then after that, then it says, they are to be for days and years. So primarily, they're for God's festivals, for God's appointed times for us to realize what's going on. And the reason why that's important, if you know anything about the calendar, the Muslims go by a strictly lunar calendar. I don't know if you knew that or not. We go by the Gregorian calendar, which is strictly solar. The Hebrews go by a solar lunar calendar. So they're following God's calendar where it says, let them be for days and years. Where did our calendar come from? Does anyone know the origin of our calendar? It's what, what is it called? It's called the what? The Gregorian calendar. That came from Pope Gregory. And you know where he got it from? Okay, he, he's the one that was tweaked the leap years a little bit from uh, Julius Caesar. Before that, it was called the Julian calendar, dated around 70 BC. And Julius Caesar represents what? Rome. Paganism. Like I said last week, if you live on the time zone change, you have to have two clocks in your house, one for where you live, one for where you work. God has always wanted us on a different calendar. Uh, going back to what the lady had said earlier, or someone, one, I think you said, when did this change take place? We've got to realize God has a calendar and man has a calendar. Uh, we use both. They're both necessary. 
But to live our spiritual walk, we need to be on God's calendar. Uh, I have here in your notes, uh, the Hebrew calendar is the annual calendar used in Judaism. It's based upon both the lunar cycle, which defines the months, and the solar cycle, which defines the years. Uh, sometimes what we do, we add one day every four years for leap years. Okay, they add an entire month, seven times in a 19-year cycle is how they do theirs. So it's a, it's a completely different cycle. But it's very good to uh, get a Hebrew calendar that also is a Gregorian calendar where you can see both what day it is on our normal calendar and what day it is on the biblical calendar as well. The Antichrist does not want us to know the appointed times. You're going to see this here in Daniel 7, verse 25. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he thinks to change what? Times and laws. Do you know what the Hebrew word for times is? Moed, the divine appointments. He wants to get the Christians off of the biblical calendar and celebrate different calendar so we don't, we're not ready and we're not aware of what's happening. So all of a sudden we, we don't catch it. Isn't that pretty s- slick of him? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to do that? I mean, if you had to make an appointment, a very important, let's say you're a competitor, you're in business, and you have a competitor, and you're supposed to meet one of your suppliers or something like this on a certain day, and then have the other guy call, hey, guess what, this is so-and-so, let's change the date. Well, all of a sudden you're there, and guess what? The other person isn't. So it's very important. We understand how important these times are. Uh, Amos 3.3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Very important. Uh, again, with God's calendar. Can, I mean, sometimes Vicki gets mad at me. I'm walking five steps ahead. She guys will be, get back here. You know, you walk with me. And uh, we need to walk together with the Lord. All right? I mean, you may agree that you're going to go on vacation as a spouse. But if one of you wants to go to Hawaii and the other one wants to go to California, you're not in total agreement. If one of you wants to go by plane, the other one by boat, you're not in total agreement. So we need to realize we need to be in agreement with God if we're going to walk with him. And so uh, let's take a look at the next one. It says, uh, the word proclaim there in the Hebrew, uh, at the very beginning where it says you shall proclaim, the word proclaim there means uh, the idea of accosting somebody grabbing a hold of them and calling them out by name. In Leviticus 23, at the top of page 2, here's what it says. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath. So the Sabbath uh, could have been any day of the week in this particular situation. And today is the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. This is the first of Tishri. And it says it's to be a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So here again, you see it's to be a dress rehearsal. Now, what is it to be a memorial of? When you think of a memorial, you can also think of like Memorial Day. And what do we do on Memorial Day? Those that died in the service, right? Right? Well, this is to be set up as a memorial. In the Hebrew, it's like a memento. Uh, look at uh, Strong's number 2142. It's zakar, and it means to mark it so it's recognizable. To remember, to make mention of it, to be mindful, make to be remembered, or a memento. And so I have different mementos here. Let's say you've been to some place and you collect uh, mementos. Well, God wanted his children to remember. And so he, how many of us know we forget things? So he said, this day is to be like a memento to you, for you always to remember something. Well, uh, what the Bible says, if the Lord doesn't remember you, what is that a sign of? I mean, he wants us to remember him, right? And he wants to remember us. And if the Lord has no remembrance of a person or a nation, then that means basically they've been rejected by him, right? Right? As a matter of fact, in Luke 13, it says, uh, He shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. So when he says, I don't know you, he's saying, I don't remember you. So he wants us to remember him, and when we do that, he will remember us. You're going to see that more here in a little bit. So in Numbers 10, 9, the next clip, it says, If you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, you shall blow an alarm with trumpets and what? 
you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. And so the whole concept of this day is to be remembered. We want to remember God, and he, we want him to remember us. And so we sing here, by blowing the shofar, I will remember you. It's like the crying out of the shofar, God, help us. And we see in Malachi 3, uh, verse 16 through 18 on your notes, it says, Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And there was what? A book of remembrance was written before him that feared the Lord and thought on his name. And God says here, They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make it my jewels. I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall re you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serveth him not. This is kind of talking about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, the evil servants and the good servants. That's what this is saying. Okay, you're going to know who are his and who is not his. And so we see uh, this is what one of the things that this is a memorial of. The next clip. Did you know that in Judaism, this is also the same day Isaac was bound by Abraham? When God asked Abraham to offer up his son, his only son Isaac, that happened on this day. This is what is taught throughout Jewish history. It's believed that the offering of Isaac occurred on Rosh Hashanah. It is said among the Jews that when God hears the sound of the shofar, he is moved to leave his seat of judgment and go to a seat of mercy and forgiveness. And remember what Abraham caught in a thicket was what? And so the ram's horn is to remind him to show mercy and not judgment. Isn't that interesting? So this is what we're to remember. And who does Isaac represent? Yeshua, exactly. So we're saying, remember the Lord. You know, remember Isaac. This is what we're to remember on this day. And so we see on the, the next uh, clip, uh, Numbers 29.1. Look what else it says here. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. Again, a separate verse that always says, you know, let two or three scriptures give witness. You can't take one verse by itself. And it says, you shall do no servile work. It is a day, and the Hebrew word for day is yom, a blowing, and the Hebrew word for that is teruah, of the trumpets to you. So that's where you get yom teruah from, which is what this day is called. It's, many of you are familiar with Rosh Hashanah, but that really isn't an accurate term. It's actually yom teruah, and this is the verse that comes from, which means day of blowing. And, and I said it last week, I don't know if you remember, but it's not... Yom Kippur, it's Yom Kippur. And it's not Yom Teru, it's Yom Teru. Yom means to roar like the sea. So when you say Yom Kippur, you're saying roaring like the sea atonement rather than day of atonement. Okay, so it's Yom Kippur. Uh, so Teruah, now look at what Teruah means. Uh, on number 8643, it not only can mean blowing, it can mean uh, an acclamation of joy or a battle cry especially a clangor of trumpets, to blow an alarm, to rejoice, and what else? Shout. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of words that you're going to be picking up as we're reading this that you may not have ever understood before, but all of a sudden now you're going to see the Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets all through here. The key words, you're going to see alarm. You're going to see trumpets. You're going to see shouting. So those are some of the key words. And in 1 Corinthians 14.8, Paul even says, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? The whole purpose of the shofar was to be a battle cry. But if, if you don't understand what the correct sound is, how are you going to know if it's a call to a meeting or a call to war? Uh, and then look at Psalms 47.5. It says, God is gone up with a what? That's the Hebrew word teruah. And the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. And that's not a man-made trumpet, that's the shofar. Well, that is exactly what 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is quoting. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what? With the voice of the archangel, with the shofar of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's speaking of Yom Teruah in this verse. Do you see that? Look at Zechariah on the top of page 3, chapter 9, verse 14. It says, and the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the shofar, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. 
This is why in Psalms 89, 15, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. The word sound there in Hebrew is teruah. That's why it's blessed are you if you know the sound of the shofar, because that is the sound of the, the rapture blast. That is the sound of the shofar. Now, one of the idioms, the first one we're going to take a look at here, is the time of Jacob's trouble. And why do I know that it will be happening on this day? We're going to take a look at that. Let's start with Jeremiah 36 and 7. It says, Ask now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And then Isaiah 26, 17 here it says, as a woman with child that draws near the time of her deliveries in pain and cries out in her pain, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. Isaiah 13, 6 through 8 also likens this day like that. It says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty, therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travails. They shall be amazed one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? And then Daniel 12, 1. It says, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people, and there shall be what? A time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time your people will be delivered, everyone that has found what? Written in the book. You're going to find books is another very important term for Yom Teruah. Because if you remember, I said it's the opening of the books, the opening of the gates. Whenever you hear about opening of books, gates, all these are key terms. Now here's, here's your key verse here. This is Zephaniah 1, 14 through 16. The great day of the Lord is near. Now what day are they talking about? The tribulation. And it says, it is near, and it hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness. Very important word there. It's a day of darkness and gloominess. It's a day of clouds and even thick darkness. Now look at this. It is a Yom Teruah. It is a day of the shofar and alarm against the fenced cities. So right there in the Hebrew, it's telling you this day is a day of blowing the shofar. It's a day of blowing. Let's look at Matthew 24, 7 and 8. It says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Uh, the Greek word for sorrows here literally means uh, like childbirth pains. And then here in Amos 5.20, we see that the day of the Lord is to be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. So are you getting an idea of what the day of the Lord is going to be like? Okay, not good. Now, how many of you know the book of Proverbs also is a prophecy? Have you ever thought of Proverbs as being prophetic? Look at this. This is Proverbs chapter 7. Oh, we're going to start with Revelation 17 first. Revelation 17. It says, and upon her forehead was a name written, uh, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of what? Harlots and the abomination of the earth. Now let's take a look at Daniel 11 for a minute. This is talking about the Antichrist. And it says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt by what? Flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Oh, Proverbs 7, verse 1 through 3. He says, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. And my law, and the Hebrew word for law is Torah. Very important. As the apple of your eye. Bind them upon your fingers, write them on the table of your heart. The word for Torah, if you'll notice, uh, actually means to teach. Law is an inaccurate translation. Whenever you read the word law, that is incorrect English translation because uh, most of the time it refers to the Torah, and the word Torah in Hebrew literally means to uh, teach or to point out, like with the finger, like you're teaching, okay, to hit the mark. How many of you know sin means to miss the mark? Torah means to hit the mark. That's literally what it means. It means to flow as water, like the rain. With that understanding now, let's go to Proverbs 7. Let's look at verse 4 through 10. And why do they want to understand the Torah and hold it as the apple of their eye. 
It says, say unto wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinswoman, that they may keep you from who? The strange woman, from the stranger which does what? Flatterers with her words. And then it says, for at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. And I discerned among the youths a young man who was void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. What in the world is he doing there, you know, to begin with? And he went the way to her house, and it says, it was in the twilight, in the evening, even the what? And when you hear black and dark night, what do you think of? The time of Jacob's trouble. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of what? A harlot. You're thinking of the book of Revelation, subtle of heart. And then look what she says in verse 13 through 15. She caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vow. So she's a religious harlot. And she says, therefore came I forth to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. Okay, they're, they're seeking you. Now let's take a step back for a minute. Look at Mark 13, 34. It says, the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Now, who is, who's the one that took a far journey? Jesus, Yeshua. Let's look at Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, delivered unto them his goods, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, every man according to his several ability, and straightway he took his journey. So we see the son of man is Yeshua who's gone on a far journey and he's given money, authority to his servants. Look at Matthew 20. It says another parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that's a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when they received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. Who's the good man of the house? Yeshua. Okay, the Lord. Well, now let's look at Proverbs 7, see what the harlot says. She says, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. The good man is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home at the appointed time. Even the devil knows the biblical calendar, and he knows Messiah will come back and begin his millennial reign on the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you know what the Hebrew word for day appointed is here? It's on your notes. It's kese, and it means the full moon, the, full, the festival of the full moon. Why is that significant? Because Passover, unleavened bread, started on Nisan 15. If you remember, Nisan 14 was Passover. Nisan 15 is the unleavened bread. On the Hebrew calendar, that means a full moon. Feast of Tabernacles is on Tishri 15. That means a full moon. Today is the new moon, and so it's the Feast of Trumpets. And so the festival of the full moon yet to be fulfilled is the Feast of Tabernacles. So he begins his millennial reign tabernacling among men on the Feast of Tabernacles. Everywhere it says he comes as a thief in the night, look at who he's talking to. Uh, this I found off the internet, a great example of this church of Sardis. You see the cemetery all around it. And it says in Revelation 3, 1 through 3, Under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you live, and you are what? Dead. He's speaking to who? The dead church. And he says... Uh, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. And then he says, if therefore you, dead church, shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief. So he comes as a thief to who? The dead church. Okay, let's look at the next verse. Revelation 3. He's speaking here to the Laodicean church. And he says, because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't realize you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. And look what else he says. And white raiment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And then look what Revelation 16 says about that in verse 15. He says, behold, I come as a what? Blessed is he that watched and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. So he's directly referring to the Laodicean church. So he comes as a thief to the dead church. He comes as a thief to the lukewarm church. Did you know in Judaism, the high priest also was known as the thief in the night? The, 
the guards, the temple guards, like the ones that arrested Yeshua, they would have night watch. And the high priest would come to see if they were sleeping or not. And if they were sleeping, the high priest would go get some coals of the altar and go over and light their garments on fire. And they would run and screaming and they would throw off their garments and be running naked through the temple courts. And the high priest was literally known as one who would come as a thief in the night to those that were sleeping. Now let's look at Matthew 25, 8 through 13. It talks about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. And the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. You go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. And afterward, who we have here now, now we have the foolish virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, verily I say unto who? Unto you. Who is you? The? And he says, I don't know you. I don't remember you. You didn't remember me. I don't remember you. You watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Who's he speaking to? The foolish virgins. Now let's look at the servant's situation in Luke 12. He says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, find, when he cometh, shall find them doing what? They're watching. And it says, Verily I say to you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. So the, the good man of the house is going to be watching and not allow his house to be broken through. Be you therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. Now look what Peter immediately says. Look at, look at his words. Peter says, okay, Lord, are you speaking about this parable to us or to everybody? That's what he's saying. Okay, who's he going to come as, you know, how's this going to happen to us or everybody? Well, let's look at the next few verses. The Lord says this, okay, Peter, who is the faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his house to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. That means watching. He says, of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But now, look what it says. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of who? Of that servant will come in a day when he doesn't look for him. And at an hour he is not aware. And will cut him in sunder and will point him his portion with the unbelievers. As a matter of fact, the Lord, what did he say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 16, 3? It says, in the morning... Uh, you say in the morning it will be foul weather today, and the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the sign of the times. They, they, they didn't understand what was going on. And in Luke 19, he rebukes them, saying, If only you had known, even you, at least in this your day, uh, the very last sentence there is, because you knew not the time of your visitation. They, they weren't aware. I'm going to show you a verse here that's going to blow you away. In just a moment. First, I want you to look at 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Everyone under, uh, has read this verse. The children of this Issachar were men that had understanding of the what? They understood the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now, here's a verse you may have read a hundred times, but you may not have had this, seen this before. Look at this next verse. 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you don't need that I write unto you, because you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as what? For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But what does this next one say? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day will overtake you as a thief. Because you know it is the Feast of Trumpets. We don't know what year, but they know the appointed times. They understand the times. It's not going to come as them as a thief. They know it's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. We just don't know what year. The day is not to, to overtake us as a thief. Let's look at the next one, Ezekiel 33. It says, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land and he doesn't blow the trumpet and warn the people, 
So thou, son of man, I have set you as a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. So we are to be uh, like a warning to Israel and warning them even about these appointed times. In Jeremiah 6, it talks about, now this is a verse I know you guys at this church, if anyone has probably have got this verse memorized. But look at this. It says, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? That's the whole purpose of the Feast of Trumpets is to give a warning. That's the whole concept, is to warn. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways and see, and ask for what? Ancient paths. Anyone here familiar with the term ancient paths? The ancient path is the good way, and we're to walk in it. The festivals, the Moedims, are part of the ancient paths understanding the, the festivals, the spring festivals, the fall festivals, these are all part of those ancient paths that we're to be walking in. And it says, and when you do, you'll find rest for your souls. But you know what they said? Look at what it says here. But they said, we don't want to walk there. I don't want to walk in your path. I want to have my own calendar, do my own thing. I don't want to have to mess with that. And then look, he says this. Also, I've set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the shofar. Listen. But what did they say? We don't want to hearken. I don't want to listen to the trumpet. Hear, O earth, behold, I'm going to bring evil on this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened to my words, nor to my Torah, but they've rejected it. Very interesting. And in Isaiah 58, it talks about how we need to cry aloud and spare not and lift up your voice like a trumpet. So you can see, do you kind of see from these verses how the tribulation will begin on the Feast of Trumpets? You can see it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Now let's take a look at the next concept. Why the rapture will occur on this day. This is known as the day of the awakening blast. Daniel uh, 12.2. It says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall do what? Awake. And what does an alarm clock do? And this is known as the day of the alarm. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Isaiah 26.19 says, your dead men shall live together if my dead body shall they arise. And you see that word again. Awake and seeing you that dwell in the dust. For your dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. So you see this alarm clock here and it's almost the stroke of midnight and it's going to be saying, wake up. Now look at this verse. This is something you may not have noticed before. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. What were some of the key words for the Feast of Trumpets? Remember shouting? And the trump, the shofar, it says here, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the shofar of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And so there again, you see the whole concept of the Feast of Trumpets. Now here's what I was telling you about earlier. Look at this next one. This is a full moon. Unleavened bread was on a full moon. The Feast of Tabernacles, Tishri 15, is a full moon. But look at the new moon, the next clip. This is today. Last night at sunset was the new moon. That's why it's the first. You guys are going to get a kick out of this. Are you ready for this? Look at this. These are idioms I'm going to be teaching you. Because, you know what I mean by diaspora? The Jews were scattered to Babylon and other countries. That's the dispersion. They were dispersed everywhere. If you were a Jew and you were in Babylon... The way they would only know the first day, this was the only feast they had to celebrate that was the first day of the month. Everything else was like in the middle of the month or a week later, which is easy once you know the new moon to date it. But this one, if you're in Babylon, they didn't have cell phones. How long is it going to take for them to tell the Jews in Babylon that, guess what, you have to keep this a day? They had to light fires on the mountains, and it might take a day before they'd find out, but then it's over. So this day is kept for two days, but it was known as one long day. Now, look at the top of page seven. Why is it two days long? Because it fell on the first, the new moon, and they wanted everyone to know, especially in the dispersion. So it was regarded as one long day. This feast fell on the first. Consequently, it was known as the feast where no one would know the day of the hour it came. It was a day symbolically hidden even from Satan so he would not be 100% aware of its arrival because he's scared to death when this, because he knows the calendar. And so look at 1 Corinthians 2.8. Here's a good example. It's which none of the princes of this world 
in other words, the demons, knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So God always keeps the devil off step. So now look at this. Because it's the first day of the month, it was two days long, and it was based on the sighting of the new moon by two witnesses, it was known as the feast where no one knew the day or the hour it was to begin. So when he's telling you you don't know the day or the hour, he's telling you it's the Feast of Trumpets. You get that? He's not telling you don't. He's telling, he's telling you when it is by telling you you don't know the day or the hour. He's telling you, guess what? It's the Feast of Trumpets because it's the only festival you don't know the day or the hour is going to begin. Now, watch this one. On the Feast of Trumpets, the shofar is literally blown 100 times. And there are three different sounds that are made with the shofar. One of them is called tekiah, and it is a long, straight blast. Another one is shevarim, which is three short blasts. And then there's the teruah, which is nine quick blasts in short succession. So there's three different blasts, and they blow it three times. So that's nine, right? They blow that series 11 times. And what's 11 times nine? Did you know the 100th blast in Judaism is known as the last trump? So in 1 Thessalonians 4, when it says it's the last trump, again, he's telling you it's the Feast of Trumpets. So when he says it's the last trump, he's telling you it's the Feast of Trumpets. When he says you don't know the day or the hour, he's telling you it's the Feast of Trumpets. There's another one that is very common that you're going to find here in a little bit. And so we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be chained in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the what? He's telling you it's on the Feast of Trumpets because that's the only feast they blow it a hundred times. And the last blast is known as the last trump. And Pentecost is known as the first trump. Rosh Hashanah is known as the last trump. Yom Kippur is known as the great trump that is mentioned in Isaiah because on Yom Kippur is when the year of Jubilee is proclaimed. But now in Song of Solomon 2, 10 and 11, which I think is one of the most misunderstood books. Sometime I'll, guys, I'll teach you guys about the Song of Solomon. It says, My beloved spoke and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair, when I come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The first thing that jumps out at me is, he didn't sleep for nights, he went into hibernation. Winter's past. And it says, the rain is over and gone. And what does the rain speak of? Blessings. Blessings. He said, you have totally missed out on all the blessings. You just want to be in the house let's say the church building, you don't want to go out and work the harvest, you just want to be in the building. The whole book of Song of Solomon is about a church asleep, and God wants to wake the church up to work the harvest. And so we see in verse 16 and 17, look what she says. Here he goes through this whole uh, discourse about how he lets he loves her, telling her to get up and move uh, to help him in the harvest, and look what her response is. She goes, my beloved is mine. Does the Lord belong to us or do we belong to him? She goes, my beloved is mine. In other words, Lord, you belong to me. I got Jesus in my pocket and I'll pull you out when I need you. She says, and then I am his. So my beloved is mine and I am his. She ends up switching this around and then changing it a third time completely as you're familiar with the book. But look what she says. She says, he feeds among the lilies until the day break and the shadows flee away. She says, turn or go away, my beloved, and be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. The word Bether in Hebrew means separation. In other words, she's on the west side of the Cascades, and she tells him, you go take a hike, you go play on the east side of the Cascades and do your harvest. I'm going to stay here and enjoy the house. And so we see in uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, what happens because of that. By night on my bed I sought him. Isn't that like this picture here? See, see her little light is shining, but... Uh, isn't that how some of us seek God sometimes, by night on our bed? She says, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but what happens? I found him not. And then now, she says, I will get up and go about the city and in the broad ways. Broad is the way of destruction. And so now she's seeking him, uh, and she says, I sought him, but I found him not. So here, and this is the spring rains. She's totally missed out on the spring rains. And now we're going to the fall rains. Look at Song of Solomon 5, verse 2 through 6. She says, I sleep. The word sleep here in the Hebrew is different than what you might think of the English. How many of us know we put our dog to sleep? But that's a different sleep than when we sleep. This sleep here means sleep to the point of death. It's the same sleep as those that sleep in the dust of the earth. 
But she says, my heart wakes. So it's like her heart's just barely beating. She's almost dead. And she says, oh, it's the voice of my beloved that knocketh. And the word knock here is not rap. It's to beat severely as if he's pounding on the door this time. And this time he says, instead of rise, my love, my fair one, he says, open to me, my sister, my love, my, uh, my undefiled. My head is filled with what? Dew. And my locks with what? The drops of the night. In other words, it's pouring down rain. And he doesn't want inside. He wants her outside to enjoy the blessings. He's saying, open the door and come out. But look what her response is. She goes, I've taken off my coat. You want me to put it on? I've washed my feet. You want me to get my feet dirty? It says, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels are moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh. My fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the what? She not only had it shut, she had it locked and barred. She wasn't at the window eagerly expecting the Messiah's return. She was sleeping, and when he returned, she had to take time to gust herself up before she overopened the door. And it says this, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. This is a type of the festivals and the people that aren't watching and paying attention. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 5.14, this is a Brit Hadashah, our New Testament verse, look what it says. Wherefore he saith what? Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That's referring directly back to the Song of Solomon here. A good example. Now here's a good example of the day of judgment, or the opening of the books, or the opening of the gates. Did you know God has always desired to forewarn us before he brings judgment? Doesn't he? I mean, isn't that God? He always wants to warn us first. It says uh, uh, the number 40 has always been a time for testing and uh, warning. If you remember, there was 40 days for Nineveh. Remember that? There was 40 days uh, for Moses after the golden calf. He tried to go up and make atonement. Uh, 40 days the Lord was in the wilderness. Uh, the 12 spies spied the land for how long? 40 days. Uh, in Numbers 13, 24, and 25, uh, it says the place was called the Brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes. So what does that tell you when you read that? The grape harvest is in the fall. This is talking about the fall festivals here. And it says they searched the land for how many days? 40 days. Hebron is where they found this cluster of grapes. And what do we know about Hebron? Who is buried in Hebron? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God took them to Hebron where they got the big bunch of grapes to see the three spiritual giants in the earth, but they were focused on the three physical giants on the earth, the sons of Anak. And so the month of Elul, there's the 40 days that we're in right now. The last 30 days is the month of Elul, and today's the month of Tishri. The Elul has 30 days, and now we have 10 days to Yom Kippur. That's a total of how many days? 40 days. This is the, the days we're in right now is the very same days Jesus was in the wilderness being tested. These 40 days are known as the, the day of testing and the day of trial. The next 10 days that we're in now are known as the days of awe. Not terror, but awe. And this is John the Baptist baptized the Lord on the first of Elul. And then 40 days later, he comes out. And if you remember, he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to open the prison doors to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, you know that only happens on Yom Kippur. In Leviticus 25, you can only declare the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. So you can see these 40 days is the same time he was in the wilderness. Now look at Revelation 14. It says, Another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her what? This is the time of the fall festivals. It doesn't say wheat. It doesn't say barley. They were all fulfilled at his first coming. Again, this is typology of the fall festivals. So now let's take a look here at this. How many of you ever heard this term? Oh, yay, oh, yay, this court is in session. Who's ever been in court before? Don't raise your hand. You're going to be embarrassed. <laughs> the right honorable judge of the universe is presiding. Yom Teruah is the day the books are opened and all pass before the heavenly judge. And then on Yom Kippur, 10 days later, the books are closed and the sentence is meted out. In uh, Jewish history, in Judaism, it is believed that every year on this day that we're in right now, the heavenly court is in session, 
the books are open, and God literally looks over every person's account to see how we took care of his investment in us. So that's what's going on right now in the heavenly court. The trial lasts 10 days until the Day of Atonement. Your life is placed on the balanced scales. Uh, the whole idea of a trial image uh, captures the sense of one's life in someone else's hands. How many of you know our life is in the Lord's hands? And we have 10 days to repent and amend our ways during this time before the judgment is set and the books are closed. And so everyone is, in the world is passing through the heavenly court like troops in review. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Look at this. We must all appear before what? Judgment seat of Christ. I believe that event will happen on Yom uh, Teruah. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And so every man's work will be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it will be revealed by what? Fire. In Daniel 7, 10 and 11. Now look at the parallels between Daniel and Revelation. In Daniel, it says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. These are the trumpets. Do you see the judgment is set? Do you see the opening of the books I was telling you about? That's exactly what this is talking about. And then it says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, and I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Well, look at Revelation 5. This is John seeing the very same thing Daniel saw. And it says, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. The number of them was what? 10,000 times 10,000 and what? Thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power. And then you notice at the very last verse there, or of the line there, it says, blessing, they're all yelling out, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that does what? Sits upon the throne. Remember I told you the Feast of Trumpets also is the enthronement ceremony of God as king? So you see, this is a Feast of Trumpets occasion. And then look at Revelation 20, 11 and 12. You see the same thing. Here you see a great white throne that speaks of judgment. And it says, I saw him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away from, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And what happens? The books are opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were what? Written in the books. So you can see the whole Feast of Trumpet is all tied to the opening of the books, the Day of Judgment, the court is in session. And then you'll also see it's the opening of the gates in Psalms 24, 7 through 10. It says, lift up your head, O you gates, and be ye lift up, you everlasting doors. And what happens? The king of glory shall come in. And the king of glory is coming in when the doors and the gates are opened on the Feast of Trumpets. And then it says, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Remember the battle cry was the idea of the Feast of Trumpets. Lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And then we see in Psalms 118, what do we want to do? Hey, open to me the gates. Let me come in. It says, open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. And Isaiah 26, uh, the next verse. Let's go to the middle there, where I have it underlined. It says, open you the gates that the righteous nation which keeps them, which keepeth the truth may enter in. So again, you see the idea of opening of the gates. And now we'll look at uh, Joel. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Blow the what? The shofar in Zion and sound the what? Alarm. That's the Feast of Trumpets. And my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For what? The day of the Lord cometh. It's nigh at hand, and it's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now let's go to verse 11 and 13. It says, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Talking about the voice of the day of the Lord. This is a prophecy that was just fulfilled very recently, as you're going to see here in a minute. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 16, it says, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, it hasteth greatly. Even the, what? Voice of the day of the Lord that we just read. And then look at the very last sentence that I have underlined. It's a day of the, what? 
trumpet, and alarm against the fenced cities. Well, now here's what's interesting. The Feast of Trumpets is also known as Yom HaKaseh, which means the hidden day. Zephaniah 2 comes right after 14 through 16 here. And 14 through 16 talks about the great day of the Lord. When it says, as near, as near, and hasteth greatly, whenever it says it more than once, like, yea, verily, verily, that means really quick. Look how many times he says before here in Zephaniah 2. It says, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, here's what we're to be doing. He's like, he's saying, hurry, hurry, hurry. He says, seek the Lord, O you meek of the earth, which have brought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, that maybe you'll be what? How many of you want to be hid in the day of the Lord's anger? I don't know if it's up, out, or where, just the fact that you're being hidden is a good thing. But look at the very next verse. What does it say? Gaza shall be forsaken. What happened two weeks ago? Gaza was forsaken on August 14th that I talked about last week, the 9th of Av. At sunset on the 9th of Av is when Gaza was, they began to forsake Gaza. So in the context of the great day of the Lord is being near and hasting greatly, you see one of the first steps is Gaza going to be forsaken. And then in Psalms 27, 5, in the time of trouble, he shall do what? Hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. Isaiah 26, it says, Come, my people, enter into your chambers and do what? Shut your doors about you and do what? Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That refers to the rapture. So again, you can see all of these things, the hidden day, why the Jews have been calling this forever. They've seen this for a long time. It's like the Christians understand the first festivals and the Jews understand the second festivals, but we've got to get the, everybody together on the same page. Now this next one's very interesting. This is uh, the wedding of the Messiah. I'm going to talk about how this day is like, how many of you want to be married to the Lord? Okay, hopefully. Look how this day typifies that. In uh, Joel 2, 15 and 16, it goes on to say, blow the shofar. And it says uh, at the very end, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So you're seeing the wedding taking place at the same time as the blowing of the shofar. And the word closet here is hoopah. Have you guys ever seen a hoopah before? Okay, there's a picture of a hoopah up there. Well, in Judaism, when they get married, they always get married under the hoopah. And what's interesting is you see here, when most ladies get married, they take on their husband's name. In Jeremiah 23, look at the very last line there. It says, he shall be called what? The Lord our righteousness. But now look at Jeremiah 33, the very last line there. This is the name wherewith she shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. It's not all caps like it is in the Hebrew. And so she takes on his name. Well, in Hebrew, there's, there's two things in a Jewish wedding. There's the erusin, or the rite of betrothal, and the kiddushin, which is the completed rite. And so on page 11 here now, you're going to see this. You're going to get a kick out of this as well. This is the picture of Eliezer finding a Rebecca for Isaac. The parents normally arranged the wedding, didn't they, back then? Well, typically, uh, the young man would go to the house of the bride-to-be carrying three items— Okay, these items are going to be a large sum of money, the betrothal contract, and a skin of wine. So if anyone came to your house, they're always going to be considered suspect. What are you doing with my daughter? What do you want with my daughter? You know, you've got this money, a skin of wine, and a betrothal contract. Well, what happens is this. If the bridal price was approved, a glass of wine was poured. But she still had to approve it. And if she approved of it, then the betrothal contract became a legal document between the two. And now they're betrothed, but not legally married, or fully married, I should say, even though they are called husband and wife. And we see in Genesis 24, 53, it says the servant, uh, Eliezer, brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold, raiment, and gave them to Rebekah. And he gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And then in Genesis 24, you see where she had to agree to it, though. They called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So she always had to agree. Well, what's interesting is in 1 Peter 1.8, Rebecca had never seen Isaac. 
And it says this, whom having not seen you love and whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Even though we have not seen the Lord, we too say we accept. And in Matthew 1, 18 and 19 is where it talks about how Mary was a spouse to Joseph. That she was just betrothed, but they still were legally married. But the completed rite hadn't taken place yet. The word espoused there uh, means to give a souvenir, like an engagement ring. Okay, so they were engaged at the time when Mary got pregnant. Now, the second thing that's very interesting, the bridal price had to be established for the bride. Now, if, if I had come up to Chip, and I, if I had said I wanted to marry your daughter, and I were to give you the bridal price of 10 bucks, what are you going to think? You don't think my daughter's worth very much, do you? Right? Well, it's the same thing. The bridal price had to be established. So the more money that you were going to put on the table, what does that tell the person? What you think their bride is worth. Well, this is what's significant. Look at the bridal price. What did it say? For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So the fact that he gave his only begotten son that t to marry you, what does that tell you what you're worth in God's sight? The bridal price. 1 Corinthians uh, 6.20, you know, you've been brought with a price. Uh, then the third thing, the bride and groom are now betrothed, which legally binds the two together, but they don't live together. And in Jeremiah 2.2, 2, God reminded Israel of that. He says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousals when you went after me in the wilderness. And in Hosea 2, he says, I will betroth you unto me forever, yet I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and judgment, loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth you unto me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. So that's a prophecy of the nation of Israel coming to the knowledge of the Messiah. This is what uh, I think is so cool. The ketubah, this is a ketubah, a wedding agreement in Judaism. And what does it state? It states the bridal price, the promises of the groom, and the rights of the bride. Well, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is our ketubah. It stated the bridal price, the Messiah, his death, the promises of the groom, and the rights of the bride. Uh, we see here that in number five, where the bride must uh, give her consent, or I do. And in Romans 10, 8 through 10, it says uh, the last sentence there, uh, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Again, we have to confess him. In Exodus 24 at Pentecost, when the betrothal took place for Israel, Israel uh, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all of his judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has said, I do, or we do. Uh, number six, uh, gifts were given to the bride. And we see in Ephesians 4, he gave gifts to men. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, not concerning spiritual gifts, so we don't have you be ignorant. So we see, just like in the Jewish wedding, he's going through the same process, and he gave uh, gifts to us. Then they would share a cup of wine called the Cup of the Covenant. And then the seventh thing that would happen, uh, this is a picture of a mikvah in Israel. Uh, they would, like a miniature baptismal thing. Uh, but the bride would have a mikvah or a water immersion. And what that was, that was a ceremonial act of separating uh, that she was going a different way now. She was, used to act one way, now she's acting another way. So now she has to learn how to be a mother in Israel. So she spends her time learning about that. Uh, in Ezekiel 16, 8 through 9 is where it says, I washed you with water. And so now we see she's now been bought with a price, and she's to spend her time preparing to live as a wife and mother in Israel, spending her days learning how to please her husband and waiting for his return anxiously, which is what we're to be doing now, learning how to please the Lord and waiting for his return. And then the eighth thing, it says, after the cup, the bridegroom would make this statement. I'm going to go to my father's house, and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what he did. And this place was known as the chamber. And in John 14, we see where the Lord says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And so here's the other interesting thing I wanted to mention. If anyone would ask a Jewish man the day of his wedding day, he would always say, only my father knows. Because he was the one that arranged it. So when the Lord says, only my father knows, that's just the typical Jewish response. Uh, number nine, the bridegroom would return. It would always be accompanied by a shout, which reminds you of Yom Teruah. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And so you see in Matthew 25, at midnight there was a cry made, or a shout, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. 
And then the tenth thing, uh, the bridegroom would abduct his bride and take her to the bridal chamber where the marriage was consummated. And then lastly, uh, number 11, there would be a marriage supper for all invited. And so here you see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in Isaiah 62, see this is all, everything, there is nothing in the New Testament that is not in the Old Testament. Uh, you can't show me any verse that I can't find a parallel. Even the parables are in the Old Testament. Uh, and here in Isaiah 62, look at this. It says, as the young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. That's telling us the Jewish wedding pattern is how it will take place. And then in Luke 14. Now, how many of us would want to be at the wedding supper? Look what this says in Luke 14. He had a, had a big supper. And they said, then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one consent began to make excuse. Can you believe that? In Revelation 19, it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come. And the last sentence there says, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And then the next thing is in Revelation 19, Let's look at the next clip here. This, I was in Israel last November. This is the Valley of Armageddon. This is from Mount Carmel, where Elijah prayed down the fire on the prophets of Baal. Do you notice anything interesting in the Valley of Armageddon there? What do you see there? An airstrip? Yeah, that's an airstrip. What's, what's strange about this airstrip you see here? No planes, no hangars. The Israeli Air Force is underground there. And they'll come popping up and take off. But the Valley of Armageddon is literally a big valley. It's huge. That's just one little part of it. In Revelation 19, it says, The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you know what that speaks of? That speaks of next week's lesson. The Feast of Yom Kippur. Every Yom Kippur, all the Jews wear white. Uh, which is 10 days from now. They all wear white. Now, isn't that interesting? And uh, at the very, about in the middle here, after it says, King of kings and Lord of lords, it says, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves to what? The supper of the great God, that they may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains. We're all going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What side of the table do you want to be on, eating or being eaten? Matthew 25, here's the same thing at the top of page 14. He spoke to him another parable, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth the servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and what? They didn't want to come. Can you imagine? So it says, they made light of it, and they went their ways. And so go down a little bit more. It says, go you therefore to the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. And so the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And so the wedding uh, was furnished with uh, guests. And it says that when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which didn't have on a wedding garment. Do you know this whole parable is in Zephaniah 1. It talks about a, a man coming in with a strange apparel. This is a good example of another parable. And then we see in Luke 14, the same thing. Here's a man, he made a great supper, and all they with one consent began to make excuses. And so he goes out quickly into the streets, and he says, compel them to come in. And then uh, lastly here is Ahamelech, the coronation of the Messiah. I'm going to show you how, I'll close with this. We've got a few more minutes. How this day is also shows you this is when the Lord will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How many of you ever heard of challah, bread? It's a real long, like loaf of bread called challah. That's what the Jews have every Sabbath. On this day, and we had it at our service, the challah is made in a circle, and it's like a crown. And they've done this for thousands of years because they believe that's when the Messiah will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords on this day. So the challah is in the shape of a crown. And, I mean, I can't, can you imagine what it's going to be like when we are all there? Do you want to see him being enthroned? I mean, that, I can't think of anything more awesome than to be there when that happens. Uh, <clears throat> so the shofar was seen not only as a call to stand trial before the judgment throne of God, but also to reaffirm God's sovereignty and kingship over the world. You always see judgment and kingship closely linked. Look at Psalms 98, 
with trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise to the Lord. The who? The king. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he comes to do what? Judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity? And I don't know if you knew this, but it was a regular practice to enthrone the kings of Israel and Judah on the first of Tishri. This is the day they would have their ceremony. And there are four parts to the enthronement of a Jewish king. The first one is the giving of the decree, the ceremony of taking the throne, uh, the acclamation, God save the king, and the subjects come and pledge their allegiance. And so you see on the next to the last page here, let's see if we can find all of this. Uh, number one, giving of the decree. Psalms 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, Yea, have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me. Then the rod or a scepter is given in Genesis 49. It talks about the scepter not departing from Judah. Uh, and the gathering of the people to him shall be. That's the rapture. Uh, Hebrews 1.8 talks about his scepter of righteousness. So he came as a prophet. He was resurrected as a priest. And he comes back as king of kings. Uh, number two, you have the whole ceremony of the taking of the throne, uh, which involves being anointed. You see in 2 Samuel 5.3, they anointed David king over Israel. In 1 Kings 1, they anoint Solomon. And then it says they blew the shofar, and all the people said what? God saved the king. And they anointed him king, and the, then you hear all this rejoicing, so the city rang. And so you can see all this happening in the enthronement of a king. And then in Revelation, look at this now. It says, after this I looked, and behold, what? What does opening of doors have to do with? The Feast of Yom Teruah. And then he heard a voice, which I heard as it were of a shofar saying, come up here. And then it says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven. Do you see the enthronement ceremony? And then it says, there was a rainbow round about the throne, and around the throne were 24 seats. And then go down to the bottom, it says, and when those beasts give glory and honor to thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever, the 24 elders fell down before him that sat on the throne. They worshiped him that lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before their throne. This is all Yom Teruah terminology. Then you have the acclamation, 1 Kings 1, let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel and do what? Blow the shofar and say, God save the king. 2 Kings 11, again, they anointed him and they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. And this is like one of the things on a Yom Teruah service. You're just clapping your hands, you're, you know, you're getting ready because it's a dress rehearsal. Can you see how these are dress rehearsals for that day? So then lastly here, uh, number four, the subjects come pledge their allegiance. Psalms 50, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may do what? Judge his people, gather my saints together. This is all Yom Truer terminology. Well, Psalms 47 is known as the coronation psalm. This is the psalm that probably will be sung at that coronation ceremony. Look what it says. Oh, clap your hands. Can you just see everyone clapping their hands as Messiah's coming down the aisle? I mean, it's going to be shouting and clapping. And it says, shout unto God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king. So you see the coronation of the king. So the decree is given and all the applause. And then in verse 5, we have the shout and the shofar of Yom Teruah. Look what it says. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the shofar. Verse 6 and 7, you have the shouting and praising of the king. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. Can you see the shouts and the praises? And it all has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, in verse 8, you have the ceremony of the taking of the throne. God reigns over the heathen and he's sitting upon the throne of his holiness. Verse 9, the believers in Yeshua are gathered in his presence and they pledge their allegiance. It says, the princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. And then we're pledging our allegiance. And then in Psalms 50, it says, He shall call to the heavens from above, to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together. Uh, Psalms 102. Now look at this. This is important. You shall arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the Moed is come. The word set time is Moed, which is a feast day. It's in the, the appointment. So that, again, is telling you it lines up with the festivals. And then Psalm 102, it says, When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. In the Hebrew, that means the last generation. So this is written to us. 
And then the last verse I have is Revelation 19, 11 through 16. But I want you to think about this picture, and I'll read this verse here. It says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. See, he's already had the enthronement ceremony, so now he's coming back. Can you see this? And then it says, he was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. You're going to see that's part of the Yom Kippur ceremony. So the Yom Kippur event already will have taken place. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed upon him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, because they've just been through the Yom Kippur ceremony. They're all dressed in white, because that's exactly what they do. And then it says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He that treads the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So can you see all these different events? There's a lot to cover in a short time here, but I just wanted to kind of give you a quick synopsis. You can see how these events will happen on the Feast of Trumpets.